Experiencing the tempest is unlikely to be boring, but defining your fun may not be entirely up to you, as numerous powers are at play. The struggling submersible, an interrupted migration to better Italian soil, a surprising Filipino trip, the sinking of the Thailand Gulf, and the Corvette Niger wedding package. The underwater world is vast and stunning, teeming with a wealth of aquatic life, exquisite formations, and breathtaking views. However, it also plays a crucial role in observation and security, especially in maritime areas marking national borders. The Navy's ability to immerse in these waters, demarcate regions, and prevent potential invasions is remarkable. This success, however, is somewhat dependent on luck, as even a minor mishap could drastically alter the situation. Submarines are designed to penetrate areas to maintain defense, security markings, and other Interpol services relevant to their sea area. They can also conduct drills to get ready for situations like that which the 53 Indonesian submarine military personnel underwent on April 21, 2021 in the Bali Sea. One of these personnel was Irfan Komang, a Navy member aboard the Kri Nangala 402, which was scheduled to conduct a routine torpedo drill to prepare them for such scenarios. Irfan was selected to join the vessel as a thriving member of the Navy. He had completed over 30 missions with the Navy, and his portfolio was constantly expanding to support his patriarchy and the Indonesian people. Other key figures on board included Commander Harry Octavian, 1st Lieutenant Harry Setiawan, 2nd Lieutenant Adi Widiarto, 2nd Lieutenant Mohamed Fajar, and 2nd Lieutenant Munawir, who were the primary commanders responsible for ensuring an adequate and organized mission setup until the end of the specific torpedo drill. The mission began in the middle of the day when the crew submerged into the Bali Sea to begin their drill. It was always tense because diving into a habitat that does not support your existence is not always comfortable, and any mistake could land you in a lot of trouble. But that is what is expected of soldiers who dedicate their lives to keeping their country safe. Commander Harry informed the crew of the drill's objectives in the control room. Technicians ensured the torpedoes were inert, and safety checks confirmed the submarine's integrity. The control room buzzed with focused energy as the simulated torpedo launch was initiated. Officers seamlessly coordinated machinery with digital images of underwater landscapes on monitor screens. Sonar operators accurately tracked imaginary targets. Commander Harry led the crew through the exercise. The crew carried out the sequence with practiced precision, firing simulated torpedoes into the virtual depths. The sonar room echoed with pings, each containing critical information. With their eyes fixed on screens and instruments, the crew worked together to acquire, track, and engage simulated targets. The usually serene Bali Sea served as the backdrop for this display of skill. The crew handled the challenges of underwater warfare with expertise gained through training. Commander Harry praised the crew for their flawless performance as the simulated engagement progressed. The control room was in the usual organized state, recognizing their collective proficiency. But the tension became palpable when the submarine, a vessel that had served the nation for over 40 years, began to display some technical issues. It was a German-built Type 209-1300 diesel-electric submarine, one of the best of its kind, but it seemed its long service had affected its efficiency, and keeping it on track became a difficult task for the crew on board as well as Irfan, as they could see the impending calamity that was coming if they didn't steer themselves. It became increasingly challenging as the vessel started to lose speed, experienced signal feedback issues, and malfunctioned severely. This led to the submarine gradually sinking into the depths of the underwater seas, creating growing tension among the crew who found themselves on the brink of death. They were aware that they should have ejected the submarine sooner, but they were hoping to save both their lives and the vessel because their first instinct was military might. But it was too late because they had gone too far into the sea, and pressure began to squeeze the vessel. After a series of screams, all communication was lost, and the submarine collapsed, killing everyone inside, including the commander Irfan Komang and all of the lieutenants. The submarine's disappearance was not confirmed for several days. However, it was declared missing earlier as they began a search for the underwater vessel in the Bali Sea. On April 24th, the Indonesian Navy changed the status of its missing submarine, KRI Nangala 402, from submiss to subsunk. The announcement dashed hopes of finding the submarine's 53 crew members alive. 
During the time frame, high magnetic force objects were discovered floating 160, 320 feet below sea level, and an oil spillage near the submarine's last known location raised the possibility of finding the vessel. Rescue efforts near the area yielded authentic evidence believed to be from the submarine, including a periscope lubricant, a torpedo protective device, and prayer rugs. The identification of the debris marked the end of Indonesia's three-day search for the 44-year-old undersea vessel, which lost contact on April 21st during a military exercise. Nothing that goes under the sea is entirely safe. So while it wasn't a planned event, it wasn't completely ruled out either. The story's ending for these 53 crew members wasn't exactly one to be proud of. When faced with adversity, people often resort to extreme measures, both in terms of what they do and how they think about it, in an effort to escape the situation. However, the question of whether or not these measures were ultimately beneficial in overcoming the difficulties remains unanswered. It is not uncommon to see illegal migrants from African countries or trafficked individuals being transported to European shores in the hopes of finding a better life or escaping the challenges they face in their home country. From June 11 to June 12, 2023, the Adriana sailed the Mediterranean sea waters from Libya, Africa to Italy, with 700 people on board, including over six Egyptians who sold their spaces on the trawler, which was designed for smuggling goods so that families could escape their home hardships and travel without going through the traditional travel process. There were nationalities from Syria, Egypt, Pakistan, Palestine, Libya, and others who were not depicted. The Adriana trawler set sail on the ocean waters toward Italy, hoping to avoid any security alarms as they sailed through various countries' coastlines. It was an exciting ride through the beautiful natural body of water, though the trawler remained overcrowded because more passengers were on the boat than were typically required. It was crowded, stuffed, and hot, but it didn't bother the passengers as they sailed, hoping for insight into better landmarks as they landed on Italian shores. Soon after several hours, they arrived at the Greek coastline. It was a long journey, but the crew hoped for a much better ending. Not long after, the crew noticed Greek coast guards sailing towards their area, most likely to inquire as to what was going on with such a large population on the trawler. A tense situation ensued as the populace engaged in verbal attacks, asserting that they were en route to Italy and needed no assistance from the Greek coast guards beyond food supplies and essential amenities. Italy or nothing, the audience jeered. The coast guards, dressed in black with their faces covered, appeared to disagree with what the crowd on the trawler suggested and decided to take the case into their own hands. They threw their lines on the trawler and began to try tolling it to their borders. But after multiple attempts failed to draw the crowd in their direction, fate intervened. As the trawler, visibly overcrowded, began to quiver and fatally capsized, drowning 700 humans, men, women, and children alike, as help was summoned from the Greek borders to try to save the dying population. It was June 13th, and several people had already died before the rescue operation could begin as multiple screams could be heard all around the Greek ocean borders. But eventually, up to 104 people were rescued, including the anonymous migrant responsible for this account, and over 80 bodies were recovered dead, with additional efforts being made to recover more. The imposed silence surrounding the Adriana shipwreck raised questions about the Greek authorities' role in one of the worst migrant shipwrecks in Mediterranean Sea history. Both the Greek Coast Guard and the Ministry of Migration have attempted to prevent the survivors from discussing their experiences. The operation rescued only 47 Syrians, 43 Egyptians, 12 Pakistanis and 2 Palestinians, all of whom were men, in an unfortunate scenario in the vast Mediterranean Sea. According to the Coast Guard, the fishing boat refused their assistance and was heading for Italy. So why did they need to tie it up if it was sailing on its intended course? And there is more. Following the shipwreck, the survivors were taken aboard a luxury yacht by its crew. Why wasn't the Greek Coast Guard doing the job? The survivors were restricted following the incident, and much is still unknown about what happened in the ghastly setting. But one thing is sure. The Greek Coast Guards played a significant role in it. Yet another scenario centered around the suffering, losing their lives in the bid to find greener pastures, to find a land garnished with milk and honey, on a dangerous sail to the grand borders of one of Europe's grandest nations, Italy. 
Numbers don't lie. And regardless of how something is portrayed, everything will ultimately be assessed based on the statistics that follow. For this reason, the saying, before you leap, track all the leaps is exceptionally relevant when improving or developing a specific situation or environment. Nevertheless, it's important to note that success is not guaranteed by merely following the numbers. In the face of such uncertainty, what is one to do? The Lady Mary Joy three ferry set sail on the southern Philippine waters in late March 2023, traveling from Zamboanga City on Mindanao Island to Jolo Island in Sulu Province. It was an exciting trip that exceeded its capacity, with 205 registered passengers and over 250 Filipinos aboard the ferry for a smooth ride to Jolo Island. Also on board was Sarah Gonzalez, a young woman on her way to see her fiancé, with whom she intended to celebrate their engagement and plot their future together. She chose the ferry ride over a flight because she valued the dynamics of touring destinations despite the country's poor ferry sailing results. In May 2022, at least seven people died in a fire aboard a high-speed Philippine ferry carrying 134 passengers, but she most likely remained unwavering. Sailing through the tranquil waters of the southern Philippine seas, the ferry came across islands with lush greenery, palm-lined shores, and vibrant marine life. The relaxing sounds of waves and distant seagulls accompanied the gentle sway. As the sun set, the sky became a canvas of pastel hues, casting a warm glow over the peaceful surroundings. Anchored in a secluded cove, the peaceful ambiance was marked by the soft lapping of waves, a perfect escape into nature's serene beauty, and Sarah appreciated every moment of it. While many opted to relax in the air-conditioned cabins below, she stayed outside on the ferry the whole time to ensure she experienced everything. It was an unpleasant surprise because they were about to approach the shores of Jolo Island when an unexpected fire broke out, escalating tensions aboard the Lady Mary Joy 3 ferry. Many passengers were asleep, so when the security alarms went off, there was panic as passengers began jumping overboard to escape the fire. As the fire spread, the captain ran the vessel aground so that more people could survive by swimming to shore. Sarah was one of the passengers who jumped into the sea in desperate hope of survival, and she was one of the lucky ones to be outside the ship during the outbreak. The fire killed many of those who remained in the cabins before they could escape, and the southern Philippine waters became tense as they waited for rescue from the nearby island's coast guards. As the blaze ripped through the ferry off Baluk Baluk Island in Basilan province, rescuers, including the Philippine Coast Guard and fishermen, rescued 195 passengers and 35 crew, with Sarah among the fortunate survivors. According to reports, 31 people were killed, and the count continued to climb, including a six-month-old poor baby. It was a sad scenario that drew a lot of attention. Authorities stated that 14 people were injured and seven were missing. There could be more people missing because the vessel's passenger count exceeded the 205 listed on the manifest. Survivors were transported to Zamboanga and Basilan, where the injured were treated for burns and partial drowning. It was an upsetting scenario, as Sarah Gonzalez eventually met her fiancé, who was grateful for her life and another chance at a better future. This was another case where numbers don't lie. And with the poor Philippine Sea Transport, with its poorly regulated ferries prone to overcrowding and accidents, many of these scenarios could continue unless drastic measures are taken. Unforeseen circumstances, as the name suggests, are events that are highly challenging or nearly impossible to predict or prevent. It's remarkable how we sometimes manage to avoid the expected consequences when nature surprises us even in the most unexpected situations. Yet this happens frequently because no one plans for their misfortunes. On December 19, 2022, the Navy Thailand warship, HTMS Sukhothai, sailed the Gulf of Thailand in salute to the founder of the Thai Navy, as orchestrated by Thai Navy Admiral Cheung Chai Chum Cheung Pat. The ship, over 40 years old, underwent multiple stages of development and upgrade to ensure its effectiveness and efficiency in handling such tasks. It was one of only seven corvettes in the Royal Thai Navy. Sukhothai was one of two Ratnakosan class corvettes built in the United States by the now defunct Tacoma Boat Building Company with the lead ship HTMS Ratnakosan FS441, commissioned in 1986 and Sukhothai commissioned in 1987. 
Through the port in the Bang Safan district of central Thailand, 106 Navy military and commanders boarded the vessel. It was a fantastic expedition as the ship patrolled 20 miles from the port in the Gulf of Thailand to honor the founder of the Royal Thailand Navy. And it did not disappoint. They sang their anthem and made commemorative remarks while saluting in the ocean atmosphere. And everything appeared to be going well until a storm broke. The upheaval appeared to be worse than usual, and tensions rose among the crew as the technical team requested assistance from the base. At nearly midnight in the Gulf of Thailand, the Navy ship faced a critical situation when powerful waves breached its defenses. Seawater infiltrated the electrical systems, resulting in a catastrophic loss of power and control. As the ship tilted dangerously, emergency procedures were initiated. Crew members battled flooding, attempting to restore functionality amidst the tumultuous sea, and issued a distress call for immediate assistance. The technical battle against the elements took place in the unforgiving maritime theater. The Royal Thai Navy, RTN, dispatched the frigates His Thai Majesty's ship, HTMS, Bumibol Adulyadej, FFG-471, and HTMS Kraburi, FFG-457, as well as the landing platform dock His Thai Majesty's ship, HTMS, Angthong LPD-791, to assist Sukhothai. However, only Kraburi was close enough to arrive at the scene before the ship sank. Additionally, two RTN helicopters were deployed to the scene. Of the 106 sailors on Sukhothai's crew, 78 were evacuated to the frigate Kraburi. 28 sailors remained in the water and were in critical condition. Over 20 of the remaining sailors were later confirmed dead as their bodies were retrieved and mounted by their families and the larger communities from which they came. It was an unexpected and heinous scenario that Thais, particularly the bereaved, could not accept with the majority blaming the Navy for carrying out such a deadly patrol. Navy Chief ADM, Chung Chai Chum Chong Payet, who attended the funeral, apologized. The Navy is sorry for the loss of our men, and I apologize for the Navy's inability to save their lives despite strong efforts. The Navy will not abandon the search operation and hopes to find some survivors. The sinking was the first of a Thai warship in 77 years, but it doesn't matter how long because losing a life which is more valuable than anything else in existence, is not easily forgiven. Fate. A child born today could die tomorrow, but another child could live for a century. Another example of how unfair fate can be and the surprises it always has in store for us, depending on our path. Fate is beautiful but can also be dubious, just like a coin. No matter how wonderful a scenario, it could also be highly destructive. On June 14, 2023, a beautiful wedding was held in the village of Egboti, Niger State, Nigeria, with people from all over the state and neighboring states in attendance. The most notable neighboring state was Kwara, which had indigenes from Ibu, Dizakan, Kapata, Kuchalu, and Sampi, all in Patiji. It was a wonderful occasion, and they had all arrived at the location in their chartered vehicles and bikes. The air was filled with excitement as attendees wore vibrant traditional attire, each outfit a masterpiece of intricate designs and vivid colors. The ceremonial venue, adorned with traditional Yoruba fabrics and ornaments, provided the backdrop for the union. The sounds of talking drums echoed, signaling the start of the festivities. The bride, resplendent in her ASO OKE attire, walked gracefully to the rhythmic sounds of music and joyful cheers. It was the usual and exciting way weddings are held in the area, only more so. Guests enjoyed a feast of flavors, sampling delectable Nigerian dishes such as jollof rice, momoi, and other delicacies. The aroma of spices filled the air, creating a sensory experience that reflected the cultural richness of the event. The celebration continued as the day faded into the night under a starry sky. The venue was adorned with fairy lights and the dance floor erupted with energetic performances of traditional Yoruba dances and contemporary Afrobeat music. The talking drums blended seamlessly with modern beats, bringing the crowd together in a rhythmic celebration. It was so spectacular that it took until the darkest of hours for the crowd to disperse back to their homes and neighborhoods after congratulating the couple and their families. Everyone who witnessed the incident made beautiful comments on their social media accounts. Another cause of the delay was rain, which fell during the final stages and flooded the roads in the area, a significant problem in Nigerian states due to poor road management. 
As a result, the 300 crowd members from neighboring Quara State had to use boats to return to their area, in addition to the country's high rate of road crimes. The boat appeared overcrowded, but no safety personnel were present to inform them of the number appropriate for the journey. So they set off joyfully, all filled up and returning to their destinations. It was all good and merry as they talked about the celebration and sang their hearts out until the locally built wooden craft moving through the Niger River, one of Africa's longest at 2,500 miles, struck a log, split in two, and capsized, plunging everyone into the mercy of the Night River. Most villagers were unaware of the accident until hours later because it occurred around 3 a.m. in the early morning hours. It was those alert villagers who rushed out when they heard screams of dying people and began swimming to rescue them, deploying their boats and bringing light to ensure everyone could see the area properly. The rescue mission continued until the day broke properly, at which point the rescue mission was alerted and the police brought in additional aid to assist the drowning indigenous people. At least 144 people were rescued alive, while over 100 were declared dead and many wedding guests went missing. It was a dramatic shift from a period of fun and enjoyment to a battle for life and death on the Niger State River between the borders of Quara and Niger. Fate is unpredictable, and while we never know what will happen next, that should be all the more reason to make the most of every opportunity.